Okay. All right. Well, welcome to our first regional dialogue on adult basic education. It's an exciting initiative through the Brazos Valley Council of Governments with, uh, with the Brazos Valley Council of Governments and KMU TV. Um, now, the fact is that when you came here today and when you leave here today, adult education is not an exciting topic. It's not a, uh, it's not, people don't want to talk about adult education, uh, you know, like, you know, common conversation. Uh, this, this topic is extremely important. And what we want to do today is engage and uh, really uh, open up and talk honestly about this issue in our region. Um, the fact is that over 35,000 people in our region don't have their GED. Uh, people with low literacy are more likely to need unemployment checks, food stamps, and subsidized housing, and they're more likely to end up behind bars. Let's talk honestly about this. Let's be serious about this. This isn't, this isn't a, a light subject. You're not going to walk outside these doors and people aren't going to be wanting to talk to you about adult basic education. Let's get some excitement around this and, and increase public awareness. That's what we're doing today. We, our goal, our purpose, our mission, uh, with every question that we ask and every, every part of the discussion we have is to increase public awareness. Uh, we're taking um, a scientific approach uh, to this issue. In order to get to the right solutions, you've got to ask the right questions. And that's what we're trying to do today. We're trying to ask the right questions so we can address fundamental issues in our community and fundamental barriers that families and households face. Um, there's two fundamental problems with adult education. The first, the first is students dropping out of school. Okay? So you have students who are dropping out who are currently in school saying, I am going to drop out, I can no longer take this, I'm going to drop out, and I'm going to face the lifelong uh, impacts, negative, negative consequences of dropping out of school. The second part of the fundamental part of this problem is adults not wanting or not uh, desiring to come back to school and complete their education. It's two parts, two, two different types of solutions and two different topics that we're going to engage heavily into today. There's going to be three parts to the dialogue. The first part is going to discuss what is the problem. And these questions are going to be towards our graduates. We have uh, seven wonderful uh, role models and graduates here from our region here with us today, as well as in our outlying sites uh, in Caldwell, Hearn, and uh, at Madisonville. The uh, second part of our dialogue is going to ask, why does this problem exist? And these questions are going to be geared towards both, both our graduates and our regional leaders who, have, who are able to join us today here in our studio, as well as in our outlying counties. And the third part of the dialogue is, how is this issue being resolved? What's being done? And that's going to be questions towards both, uh, both, both parties. But to begin, uh, I want to have each individual introduce themselves, uh, state your full name, who you are, uh, uh, why you're here today, and, uh, and um, let's go ahead and start with Kayla. Hi, my name is Kayla South. I'm 25 years old. I just graduated the GED program at the workforce in September. I came to College Station to better myself, not only for myself, but for my son. And doing that, I found it really hard without my GED, and I found it really hard to do everything I had to to get that. But taking the opportunity to do it has put me farther, and I'm still continuing to go farther because I still want to better my life, and I still want better for me. And I'm not exactly sure what y'all want me to say. That's perfect. Hi, my name's Don Cully. I'm 52 years old, and I found it really hard to find a job without the GED, so I'm back here trying to get my GED now, and I'm almost there. Hey, 
Hello, my name is Ethel Love Craig. I'm also 52 years old. I quit school at the age of 17, and for 20, 30 years, I didn't go back. I always wanted to give, go back and get my education, but circumstances got in the way. At 17, I had two kids. After that 10 years, I was on public housing, public assistance, and so I decided to move to Houston to better myself, my position. I did get a better job, but I also had a 25-year history of crack cocaine. And I thank God to this day, 2009, he delivered me from crack cocaine. In 2011, I decided to go back to school to get my education, which I did with Erica at the workforce. And I'm, right now, I'm in my second year at Blinn College, and I thank God for that. My name is John Fazzino. I'm 32 years old. Uh, I decided to go back to college. Well, I got my GD, and I decided I want to go back to school because I'm just tired of working to survive, and I want to actually do something that I enjoy, and uh, that'll give me some fulfillment in my life. My name is Barbara Faulkner. I'm 59 years old. Um, I quit school for bad home life. I uh, thought that things would change, and I got in a bad relationship. And I've worked two jobs most of my life, raising my children, because it was my responsibility. I didn't know, and it might not have been at that time, help where you could go for your GED. But I praise the Lord now. Um, my children all graduated and went to college, and I've got grandchildren that are graduating and going to college, and so I want to let them know and, so, you know, support them to go their way with the education because I've had to work really hard and most of the time work a man's job in order to make enough money to support my children. My name is Isidro Peña. I'm 69 years old. Economics has not been a factor in me going back to school. I have made a considerable amount of money over my history of my careers. I became an industrial plastic specialist. But there's other things in life. I wanted to continue my education, and I also wanted to subsidize my Social Security. Well, not having a GED, that hindered it. Going back to school, that was out of the question. Uh, so the thing to do is get my GED and then pursue a different career than what I grew up in. Thank you. My name's Scott Dye. Um, I dropped out when I was a sophomore. Yeah, sophomore in high school. And uh, since the day I dropped out, I've been going through a lot of things, such as, you know, bouncing around from homeless shelters. And I got married at a young age. The relationship was not all what it was cracked up to be. And it pretty much sucked me down to rock bottom. And I was working a bunch of blue-collar jobs, which I'm not bashing blue-collar jobs, but I see myself doing something better, you know, able to do something I actually like to do. So I just recently got my GED a few months ago, and uh, I'm going to be starting at Blaine hopefully this next semester. So, yeah, that's... Okay, and now we're going to introduce our regional leaders. If you guys would go ahead and step up to that mic right there, starting with... Uh, Chrissy Hester with College Station ISD. Hi, I'm Chrissy Hester. I work in the College Station School District, and I work with students at all, level, all levels with all kinds of issues and work with the faculty and the administration to get programs that 
will keep you all from being in the position you're in today and try to build relationships so that won't happen. Hi, I'm Sally Ryan. I am. I work with Region 6 Adult Ed. I work with an intensive college readiness program, which is a bridge program to help students attend Blinn College. We also have a GD there. And um, in addition to that, I am also a GD graduate and a, um, well, now a Texas A&M student. So. <laughs> Hi, I'm Leroy Morales. I'm here as a representative of the Bryan Independent School District. I am the principal at the Mary Catherine uh, Harris School. One of our programs there uh, is the high school equivalency program in which students work toward uh, the GED. And so I'm here to answer or hopefully answer some, some of the questions we have today about the issue we're facing. Hello, my name is Crystal Goodman, and I work for Bond ISD. I'm the executive director of HR and administration, and I supervise MC Harris, our school for GED. And we also um, work hand-in-hand -hand with our uh, technology department and our data uh, people to make sure that we're finding students who are dropping out, and we're providing immediate intervention to help them get back in school. Hello, I'm Brandon Webb, Director of Communications for Bryan ISD. Just wanted to thank you all for coming also and sharing your stories with us and, uh, and reminding us that these are not numbers on a page. These are people and these are lives. Thanks for each and every one of you for being here, and I appreciate our team. And thank you for the forum, Judson. Good evening. I'm Irma Cauley. County Commissioner, Precinct 4, as an elected official, I think it's very important that I hear the stories and do what I can to provide services where we can and uh, uh, just collaborate where we can. Thank you all for sharing your stories, and I hope that we will be working together in the future. Thank you. I'm Tom Wilkinson. I'm the Executive Director at the Brazos Valley Council of Governments. I am Erica Park, the BVCOG, or Brazos Valley Council of Governments GED Program Coordinator. Right. And now we'd like to uh, move to our outline sites. I'd like to say uh, first a big hello to Caldwell ISD. Caldwell, out to Caldwell. Can you just speak up into the mic? Hello, this is Caldwell ISD. Do you guys like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Vicki Osh. I'm the principal at the high school. And I'm Dr. Janet Cummings, superintendent of Caldwell. Wonderful. Okay, great. Now we'd like to go out to Centerville. Hi, my name is Kara Dudley, and I am the Curriculum Coordinator and Testing Coordinator. I'm Byron Rotter. I'm the Leon County Judge here. And I'm Jason Jites. I'm Centerville ISD District Superintendent. Wonderful. And now Hearn. Hearn ISD. Just want to unmute your mic and... Uh, Let's see. Anyone out in Hearn? And how about Madisonville? Anyone out in Madisonville? Yes, we're here. Uh, this is Bob Coates, Assistant Superintendent of Special Programs. Uh, Randy Stanley, I work for Texas Farm Bureau. Keith Smith, Superintendent of Schools, Madisonville. Keith, Keith West, MCISD. Annette Wiseman, Madisonville High School, uh, Government Economics, and Senior Sponsor. 
Uh, Art Henson County Judge, Madison County. Bill Harden, Mayor of Madisonville. Bobby Heaton, Concerned Citizen. Wonderful. Well, welcome to everyone. I want you guys to know out in our outline sites that you are just you are here just as much as we're here in this studio. So all you got to do is just say, "Hey, I want to I want to ask a question," and and then we'll pick we'll pick you up and we'll all be able to see you. And don't be afraid to ask a question or interrupt interrupt anyone uh, anyone at any time. Um, and uh, I'm getting a, a note. I can't read it. <laughs> Oh yes, yeah. Okay, could I, and uh, could we go over to our College Station ISD side? Our, David Brower, are you there? Yeah. I'm unmuted. I'm David right. Brower with the City of College Station Community Development. And the rest of us, one, two, three. Howdy! <laughs> All right, fantastic. Okay, well, great. So uh, these, these first set of questions is to address what is the problem? And they are specifically geared to our, to our graduates who are here with us today. And I want to start by asking, what led to you dropping out of high school? So anyone who would like to answer that question? Kayla? I did not have a pleasant high school experience. My high school messed up numerous of my credits, switching me back and forth from classes because I was an athlete who could no longer be an athlete. At the age of 17, coming near the end of my 11th grade year, I could not stand the house I was in because I was not treated fairly and I could not stand how unfairly my school was treating me, taking credits away when I had went and done the classes. So I decided to finish out my 11th grade year and drop out to go pursue work where I went to Louisiana after Katrina, redid piping and electrical and a lot of really hard labor just to maintain my household and my vehicle. And that's really about it. And Ethel, I wish I could maybe bring the mic to you. Hello. What led to me dropping out was in the eighth grade, I had my first child, and I went back to school after that. I found myself pregnant again, entering into the tenth grade, and the fathers went around. And so I ended up having to quit. For one thing, I was ashamed being around my peers because it seemed like I had to let them down. Plus, I had to stop and get a job and try to help my mother help me provide for my kids. And that was the main reasons I dropped out. But I always did want to go back, and I finally got the opportunity. Fantastic. Anyone else would like to answer what led to you dropping out of high school? Absolutely. I didn't have a bad high school experience. Actually, I loved high school. Uh, my home life was pretty tough. I didn't really have uh, much support. So I moved out when I was 16. I was still going, uh, I moved towards College Station. I started going to Consolidated my sophomore year. Did great the first semester. Uh, second semester, I just never went back to school because uh, I started working. And then that summer, I went to school and Mrs. Hester tried to convince me to go back to not quit and go to summer school and continue on. But I just at that time, I felt like I didn't need it, which was the biggest mistake I've ever made. PJ, or you want eight? Well, for me, I liked school when I was younger. I was very athletic, and um, I had uh, coaches that come when I was in elementary school help with the volleyball and stuff like that. But as I got in junior high, things changed, and you have different classes and. Some of my teachers had my older sister, which, because they had problems with her, I got the brunt of the headaches for it. It was like, oh, men talk? And so I didn't have a good experience with some teachers because of being related to my sister. And so 
as home life went on and things were bad at school, um, I just thought, you know, I've had it. And so I thought, well, I'll just quit school. And of course, my dad didn't want me to quit school, but home life was bad, and I had moved out when I was 15 and uh, stayed with some friends of our family. And then my dad wanted me to come home, and I was still in school, but um, it was just bad at home, and I couldn't think straight. My mother was a perfectionist, and so I couldn't do anything right. So low self-esteem. That was me. Um, I know now that I can do whatever I put my mind to, and I'm so thankful for the GED class because uh, Miss Erica and Joe and um, Rosemary have helped me to gain some self-confidence. And uh, I'm just excited that I was able to finish school and um, looking forward to helping younger people to understand that quitting school is not the answer. It's the beginning of the problem because I've had to work hard um, most of my life to raise my children because their dad was never there and didn't support him. Um, I'm thankful that there are classes that um, are helping young people. And so, but it's all good. It can be if we just stick with it. Our next question is, what's a specific circumstance or factor more than anything else led to you dropping out of school? Any of our other graduates like to answer that question? Yes, sir. There were several factors as why why I dropped out of school. One, of course, uh, unsupportive parents. Number two, uh, the oldest of eight, I helped supplement my father's income. But I think the main factor why I walked out of school at age 50, was a teacher. I was pretty good in math, and I had excellent grades in math. I was in high school. I had jumped the second to the third grade, so I never went to the second grade. My averages in math were extremely high. In high school, first semester of algebra, average. <clears throat> Teacher walks up to me and says, look, I know you're cheating. You have to be cheating. I've been teaching school for umpteen years. Nobody's ever got a hundred in my class. And you're not going to be the first. So I got a ninety-nine. <laughs> I remember this before segregation. Second semester, she sat me beside her, rolled up her sleeves. This went on the first six weeks. Second six weeks, she says, "Well, you have to take off your shirt." I picked up my pencil and paper and I walked out of school. Again, remember. My father was never home. My mother spoke little or no English. And I had a job. I was making good money. I was making more money part-time than my dad was making full-time. So the alternative was put up with the teacher or just leave. So I left it. I want to ask, 
What could have been done to prevent you from dropping out? What could have been done to prevent you from dropping out? Commissioner Colley, absolutely. Um, Mr. Pena's sure. um, story touches me personally because I don't know if we had the same instructor, but I had an instructor um, that challenged me. Um, I'll never forget, his name was Mr. Banks. And uh, he was a um, ge um, geometry teacher. So he says to me, I, I don't expect anyone in this class to make a name. Well, Mr. Pena, I made an A. I made an A because he didn't expect it of me. And I can understand how it is some people will take a challenge and turn it around. Others will take a challenge and it just deflates them. So even though we are all made in God's image, we're not all alike and we don't handle um, issues Alike, but I want you to be encouraged and to know uh, your story sounds just like mine. But let me tell you what happened f with me. After um, I got my first A from him, he allowed me to teach the class. Now that boosted my, my self-image. It boosted my ideas about math. I didn't go into math. Uh, my career is criminal justice. But it made all the difference in the world uh, that that teacher challenged me. In your case, unfortunately, it was different. I think that it's important that educators know what influence they have on every student. You know, when you uh, walk into a classroom these days, you don't know the children's stories. You don't know what it took to get that child in that classroom. And being raised in the projects, I know for a fact teachers label you from where they think you've come from. The difference in our home was my mother was um, an LVN, divorced, so we lived in the projects simply because we couldn't afford to live anywhere else. But mother insisted that we get an education. She insisted that when we go to class, we don't act a fool because her words were, if you act a fool in, in, at school, I'm going to come and I'm going to act a fool with you at school. Because she knew that the education of her children were the only things that were going to get us out of the projects. She never uh, doubted that we would go to college. She simply said, if you make the grades, you'll get in. We did. Some of us did not complete college. Some of us did. The thing is, we do need the support of parents. We need the support of the teachers. We need teachers that would have a heart to teach. Because every child is not going to come to the classroom ready to learn. Some of us come hungry. Some of us come tired. You know, some of us come from abuse, not just physical, mental abuse. It's just as damaging. I would like to say that being the oldest of eight, I made sure that the rest of them graduated. I'm loving this. This is what this is what we want. I, and you feel free to get up out of your seat because you've, we've got an hour left. And I don't. And when you walk out of here, 
No one's talking about this issue outside, outside of our studios, outside this conference. So let's get some questions. Let's get some meat here. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Come on up, please. I left for a different reason. My father was disabled in a car accident at the end of my ninth grade. My mother couldn't make enough to pay the bills. So I quit school and I went to work. And it took him like two years to get his disability through. So by that time, I had a good job, and I just didn't bother going back. I wished I would have. I was real good in school, and I enjoyed it. But the circumstances were where I had to help support my family, and that's what I did. Judson, the commissioner brings up a great point. Um, myself as well, I'm first generation college student. My parents both worked, uh, pulled themselves up by the bootstraps. We come from a long line of farmers. And um, so my parents wanted me to go to college, but they didn't know how to tell me how to go to college. And um, so they said, well, we want you to go to college or do something. What I find now is going to college, I am raising a second set of children now. I'm raising grandchildren. My children, it was not an expectation. I wanted them to go to college, but I didn't know how to tell them to, how to get there. And I think a lot of the barrier is to tell students how to finish school and how to get to college. I, I think that, that you have more incentive to finish your high school if you have a path ahead of you, but if you're not sure where you're going, you don't have that. I was also very smart but I was not smart as far as self-esteem. I had very low self-esteem. I didn't want to complete school. My grandchildren now, I have one that's eight, and since he's five, we've been talking about going to college, and a lot of you know this story. And my grandson wants to be an engineer. And he pointed to the building the other day and said, this is where I'm going to go to school. So having that at the beginning and having what the commissioner had where it's you're going to college, it's just about where you're going, and helping our children set goals and helping parents be the ones to help set those goals because we as parents really feel not adequate because we don't have a college degree in how to tell our children to get there. And so helping us to be able to do that would be a great asset for us. These are such moving stories, and I really, I'm like you, Judson, I'm really excited to hear some of the conditions and circumstances, um, but I don't think they're unique. I think it happens to a lot of folks, but, but I'm concerned. Um, I think we ought to encourage everybody to go to college, but I think it ought to be based on skills. We've got to change the terminology, in my opinion, to talk about skill sets. College isn't necessary for everyone, but everyone should be able to make a living and at a wage that supports their family. So the only way to do that is through finishing high school, but with a high school diploma that also leads toward a skill if that's what you want to do. We don't talk about that. We, we give them eighth graders, get to do a career investigation. In my experience with eighth graders, at least the three I raised, they're stupid. That's the worst time to talk to people about anything because they don't listen. We need to start earlier, like we do, talking to your grandson about college early. But it shouldn't just be about college. There are plenty of great jobs that just we need a skill. And it does require going to Blinn or to other to get that. So let's not leave the, the college only as the option, because there are many, many other. I have uh, hopefully a short comment. I think you all understand I'm passionate about this subject. And I'm delighted that you all are here. Uh, Tom, we talk about skills and we talk about uh, going to college. And when I moved here in the community in 76, it seemed like every child in Bryan Independent School District was tracked either to go to college or not. So I ran for school board in 84. And my goal was to start the community thinking about technical training. Remember, I'm raised by a mother, single parent, 
with an LVN. She wasn't a registered nurse. She went back to school, learned that trade while she was working on another job. But when I finished high school at HISD, I had a trade. I had learned to type. So I could have left high school and gotten a job, but none of my children uh, that have finished, and I have three daughters, could have left high school with a skill or didn't leave high school with a skill. So I think it's time that we look at the situation realistically. Everybody is not college material. Everybody may not aspire to go to college. But whatever field you go into, Tom, I preach now, I don't want a minimum wage job. I want a, a, a job that's going to give me living wages. It is not right for a person to work two and three jobs and still not be able to take care of your children, put food on your table. You have to choose whether the children will get shoes or or clothes, or, or, or eat today. You're right. It, that's, it's, it's, this is, it's time out for this. We want to talk about a living wage, because minimum wage just doesn't cut it. Jud, oh, sorry? I was just going to say, and I think that the job market is not just about When I talk about college, I talk about four-year college, but also um, we're working on a program. We're already partnered with Blinn and Brenham, and we're working on bringing it here, which will bring the, the workforce-type trade programs to. So when I talk about college, I, I think that, to me, is as much college as a four-year university. So when I say college, I'm talking about whatever it is that you love to do that you can get paid for that you can sustain your family on, whether it be a machinist or, or whatever that would be. So just to clear that up, yeah, past high school, post high school. Thank you. Judge, Judge Ryder, can you hear me? I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. I, I, I know you're pretty outspoken on most topics, and I think you'll have, you might have a, have, want to chime in here. I'm here. Uh, you, you know, you I have a comment. We were just talking. We were just talking here about, um, you know, and there's a, a new bill out, House Bill Five, and uh, I've said for the last five or six years that we shouldn't be channeling all our children to uh, to college, even if even if every child had the money and even if every child wanted to go to college, there's not enough classroom space for every child. I think that uh, you can those. Those kids, when they get to the eighth grade or ninth grade, they need to take some kind of a test where they have an aptitude. If they want to go to welding or electrician, they can go this direction. They still get English, basic English. They still get history and things like this to be well-rounded. But the math is not algebra. The math is not geometry. It's not trigonometry. And then you channel the others to go toward college. They may have the money. They may have the smarts, whatever it might be. But uh, every child is not made up to go to college. Um, and we've made that mistake by, I've read thing, uh, article after article of, of our congressmen, our senators. All they want to do is talk about, well, we're going to channel everybody toward college. You can't, you can't do that. And, and a, person, a person who makes, is, is welder or electrician, they can make much, as much or more than some doctors out there, as we all know. But um, and it, I'll tell you what this is going to do. It, these children who are pushed to college and are not college material drop out. You got them going this channel where they're going to have something they enjoy doing and can make money. They're going to stay in school, so your dropout rate is going to be reduced, and also our TDC rate is going to be reduced. I think the population of TDC, because they they drop out, all they got to do is they're going to either work or they're going to go rob a store or they're going to sell drugs. Whereas if they know they've got an education coming. Uh, to do something, they will stay in school and do it. If they're over here with the college kids, they know they have no future. They know their parents may not have the money to send them or whatever. So uh, I think if, if we start looking two channels, we'd be a lot better off. I was not a person who wanted to go to college right outside of high school. I also don't think it's right to direct people directly to high, uh, college right outside of high school because, face it, at the end of 12 years of school, you don't want to be there anymore. You don't want to pay attention to what's going on. 
I've witnessed in both my GED and IRC program, ICR programs where students have went from directly out of high school, they don't want to pay attention. They want to pay attention to their phone. They want to pay attention to themselves and their own social life. And I feel like some people do need to get out and go do their own thing. When I left school, I went to go work. I went to try and find a trade, and I found I didn't want to go do labor like that. I didn't want to. I also did retail and all sorts of stuff, moved back and forth between Houston, New Orleans, Austin, other little cities around Houston, outskirts and stuff. I just feel like a lot of people are pushed towards college, and the job training and job opportunities, job core, all that stuff should be you know, advocated a little bit more to the students who don't want to be in school and want to go experience life a little bit and be able to put some kind of you know, skill under their belt to where if they do decide they want to go to school and that doesn't work out, they still have something that they can, you know, have a cushion on being out in the world and not, you know, being skillless. I personally didn't really have any skills, so I had to jump back and forth between work and then once I had my son decided I needed to go and put some meaning into my life and my drive as an adult now for school has really pushed me to go on beyond what I would have done right out of high school into college and I feel like it's important for people to go and have those real world experiences and then decide whether or not they feel like they're ready to go to school or not. Judge Ryder, do you have any, any, any thoughts on that? Well, I, that's kind of some, along the same lines of what I was just talking about. Uh, you know, she was she was pushed that way. She's uh, kind of right uh, after school, especially boys do not know what they want to do. They're they're very immature. I had two, so I know exactly what I'm talking about. Girls seem to have a little bit more maturity, but they're you know they're they're everybody's made up differently as we've talked about here, and so. Uh, we should not be pushing everybody with one cookie stamp here uh, to go to, in one direction. We should have a multi directions for these kids to go, and that's where we that's where we get ourselves in trouble. You, I know that in Brown ISD that we do have it, uh, Mary Catherine Harris. We have several programs there, and even within the high schools, it's not just that straight to college. It's the post-secondary success that we're looking at. And the CAPE programs, the career technology, uh, cosmetology, um, we have uh, air conditioning, automotive, things that are, will provide that skill set for our students and that interest to stay at school. Um, I know that we are working. This is not just a today issue. We really need to work together and see how we can bring our community, our kids, back to school because at the end result is that we all benefit from them. If they're not in school, they're not up to any good. So uh, we know that. Uh, but Brian ISD, I can say, you know, we are working to meet those needs, build those positive relationships that will keep kids in school. And um, maybe in the future we'll do more work with the commissioner and, you know, and um, Mr. Morales, he's over Mary Catherine Harris and he can talk. Yes, and I will say this to you. Uh, the stories that we've heard here uh, are truly impactful. These are stories that I, I hear of each day, even today. We had a situation where a very similar uh, story is playing itself out at our campus. We're uh, what I call in a hand-to-hand -hand combat war uh, with this issue. At Mary Catherine Harris, we, we understand, well, first of all, we are a, an alternative campus in Bryan ISD, and we service at-risk students, students who are at risk of not graduating on time. And for multiple reasons, they come to our campus, none of which uh, really are, are false of their own, but it's their situation. We meet them at the door, and we take them as they are. But we understand that, that it's, it's a multifaceted problem. I myself uh, have family members who have completed the GED and have moved forward with that. I, I also broke barriers in my family by being the first to go to college. So I truly understand both ends of the spectrum. And it, what, what, what we're facing, guys, is simply this. We have to build those rela relationships and connections with our students, understand what has put them there, and then work to get that skill set to move beyond high school. Uh, it's more than just 
whatever vehicle you may use to get them that high school diploma. It really is getting the students to understand what's there right after high school. How do you get a job? How do you apply for financial aid? How do you do a college application? How, what is the college orientation day? So it's more than just whatever vehicle you can use, whether it's HCEP, which is a high school equivalency program to get the GED, whether it's a computerized program to, get, to gain credit rapidly. There, there are many, many uh, ways to get there. Uh, there are, are homeschool programs, different kinds of, of schools in place for this. But, but truly what we look at at Mary Catherine are several things. We, wanna, we want our teachers to build those connections with the kids so that the kids want to come to school, that the kids can feel like they can be successful. We want kids to also be uh, you know, part of their education and own it. But at the same time, we want to give them the bigger picture. It's, it's not an easy solution. It's not an easy fix. But it is doable. And each day, uh, we, we, we have success. This uh, first semester, we've had seven students uh, who have uh, accomplished the GED and, and have uh, passed the test. We have 20 more signed up for the test this month. And so we continue to work with these students. I've opened up my uh, GED program uh, to another section so we can allow more students to come in. And we do service uh, the, the Brian ISD students who are at risk of not graduating. This is an option for them. We, we offer other programs. The, the K programs uh, we are, are also an option we're looking at to revisit how we can get these students uh, plugged in so that they can get a skill that will really pay off in the immediate future. So. What I would say to you guys is that, you, you know, your, your stories don't go unheard. Uh, you need to keep um, championing your cause. You need to continue uh, that path of education because the battle is not over. It is an epidemic in our country and in our state. So, uh, you know, we welcome this kind of conversation. And uh, I chose to go back to college after I got my GED. I loved school when I was in school. And after my 25-year drug history, I chose to get my degree in psychology because I want to be a drug counselor. I could go to a trade school and get a license to be a chemical dependency counselor, but I wanted a degree in psychology so I could talk to somebody and know what I'm talking about when I talk to them to try to come back and uh, teach adolescents how to stay off of drugs. I didn't have that when I got on drugs. I didn't know about drugs, so I got introduced to it. And I got hooked on it. So I, I chose to be, I want to be a drug counselor for adolescents to try to keep them from getting as far off into drugs as I did and try to help them along the way. So that's my choice why I chose to study psychology and because I would like to help the younger generation. Yeah, I just want to say I am not indicting the ISD, okay? Um, I think, too, I can agree with all that you all have presented, and I, I, my door is always open. One of the biggest issues that I don't think our nation has faced is that of the worth of educators. We tend to pay as little as possible, and we put our children's life in these people's hands, and it's gotten to a point where we can't keep good teachers in the system. I, in listening to your stories, I can hear that a good teacher you know, in my lifetime, Mr. Banks wasn't the best, but he was a teacher. Lillian Bastine was the counselor that invited um, the colleges to our, our school to meet kids like myself and those that you, you have shared. We need people that will go beyond their job description. You know, we need people with vision. Studies were done in the 60s when educators were told a student wasn't a good student, that he wasn't going to succeed. Guess what? He didn't succeed. Right. He wasn't a good student, even though he may have been a 
a gifted and talented kid. This is studies in the 60s. Same difference. Students from lower income, um, less fortunate, were told, oh, they're excellent to the teacher. Guess what? Those students performed at a much higher level. They performed to that teacher's expectations. So that's why I just want to say my hat's off to any educator. However, I think as a nation, we really need to step back because if we don't educate our kids, you know why we're building prisons? We're still taking care of these people for the rest of our lives, those of us that are fortunate enough to work. So in looking at the dropout rate, let's look at the tools that we're putting in the schools. And I think the teachers and uh, administrators are one of the greatest tools that we have. We need to invest and not just talk about it, but do something about it. Well, I agree with the part that kids need. Some kids are not up for college. They have um, skills that they can use. One thing I've always found is that we always harp on the things that they're not so good at instead of helping advance the things that they are good at. If a child's good at math, let's get them going. Um, I know they, they need English and social studies and stuff like that, but the thing is, is there any way to help them advance in what they're good at? Because chances are it's in them because God put it in them, and it's for the, for the use that he has and the purpose that he has for them. Yet so many times we focus on the wrong things. But also, and I know teachers, they're not there to raise people's children, but I can tell you from experience of having a bad home life that, and I realized after my mother passed away that she only taught me what she knew and her home life was bad and so if you don't know two plus two is four you cannot teach your children that but if if we could somehow have the teachers be more in relationship with children as far as knowing kind of what their family life is like, where we can help them. Because a lot of kids, their self-esteem is down because nobody at home gives a hoot. And they come to school, and if they don't get it right and somebody else makes fun of them, they go further down the hill. And so I know from personal experience with uh, the PE teachers when I was in elementary school, um, you know, They've encouraged me, and um, they've helped me to get through a lot of things. Um, but, and it's not the teacher's responsibility, but the kids are with the teacher more than they are with their parents during the daytime. And although it's not their responsibility, but I think that it could be a great help to the, to the students to encourage them to want to go on and to keep trying. I, I personally, from experience just in my GED class, I'm a crybaby because I've, I've got a lot of hurt that I still deal with. But had it not been for Miss Erica and Rosemary um, and um, Joseph encouraging me, and saying, hey, it's okay, you know, you're doing good, and blah, blah. even if I wasn't doing good, they encouraged me. And I praise the Lord, I might not have passed with flying colors, but I passed, you know. And that's the thing is to, to encourage them, to get them motivated, because some of them, the home life, that's where all the problems start. But I've noticed through, through dealing with people that, the parents can't teach the kids what they don't know, and if, they're, if their relationships haven't been good with their parents and in school, they're not going to do their children any different. Um, it's unfortunate. Um, we have somebody has to make a change, and, but until they realize that they can make a change, then they're not going to try, but if they have the encouragement to succeed, 
then they can help their children succeed. Uh, and I, I want to ask uh, our Madisonville site about your ag program. I hear your ag program keeps students engaged, ready to finish, and, and uh, I was hoping you guys could tell us a little bit about it. Right there. Can you hear us? Can you hear yep. us now? Okay, well, we finally found the mute button, so obviously some of us dropped out of school too early. Uh, the, uh, I guess I, I've heard the stories here today, and and uh, it's uh, I want first off, I think I want to say that I really applaud those who want to go back and get their education. I'd like to look back for a couple of minutes on years past. I think Mr. Pena, someone said that he was 69 and, and he uh, was coming back after GD. Mr. Pena, I graduated the year he was born. So back in those days, but I, we had we had same circumstances, but we didn't have uh, a lot of options. Um, we had uh, we had a lot more home involvement and parental involvement back in those days. When when I didn't take home good grades. Uh, they didn't go jump on the teacher. If I got in trouble in school, they didn't go jump on the teacher. And we have nowadays, I think, too much government involved. We've had too much, uh, we've had a lack of discipline in school, and we've had a lack of parental involvement. Uh, I, I heard, listened with interest a while ago, and, and I'm, I'm right on, on board with it. Everybody should not have, maybe not should have a, a um, college education because there's jobs out here today going with a lack of people that has basic skills to do these jobs which they can learn in technical school. Uh, I didn't go to college. I, I went to telegraph school. I learned how to telegraph. And when I learned how to telegraph and applied myself, I always had a job, was able to get a job. And... Uh, and it, it went from a telegraph operator to a vice president of a company. So it can be done if you want to pursue it and, and, the, and get enough involvement for people to, st for, for the, the parents are going to have to devote the time necessary to these youngsters today to encourage them and to see that they get through. And government is going to have to butt out and let the discipline come back into the schools and uh, um, there's, there's, it, it, it's terrible that uh, some of the things that you hear coming out of the school today and things that happen. I sit in, uh, in court, with, you know, I have juveniles, and these juveniles have been involved in situations at schools and all. And it's, uh, it, but when it's all said and done, you go back to the, to the basics of, of their home home uh, uh, life and the way they were brought up and the involvement of the parent. And I think that is a huge, uh, that, that would be a huge advantage for people, for parents to get totally involved in their education of their kids. Keith? You'd like to hear from me. Uh, this is Keith Smith, Superintendent of Schools in Madisonville. You know, uh, as you alluded to earlier, we. We utilize our ag program, our auto tech program, our FCS programs. You know, I think, first off, back to HB5, that's a step in the right direction. That piece of legislation is going to pass some path, have some pathways that allow children or students to choose do we want to go a technical route or a vocational route or, or a college bound route. So that's a, that's a tremendous step in the right direction. I think, I think at the state level, obviously, that those that in Austin have seen the error of their ways and woke up and heard the cry of the parents and, and the people. Within our state, but you know, we use vocational programs, extra and co-curricular programs as a uh, as a link to to get that relationship with the student. Uh, it, it, it's very simple. The average child, sixth grader, doesn't jump out of bed at you know six thirty in the morning and scream, "I can't wait to solve for X today." But if you if you can find a good trade or a good skill or some type of programming that they enjoy, that tends to that tends to make the other. The other part, the necessary part, needed. Uh, so, as far as Madisonville goes, regardless of what the st we know what works for our children a whole lot better than those in Austin do. So we've never we've never left the vocational program. Uh, we have a lot of children that walk right out at 18 years old and become pipe pipe fitters and welders, uh, go to work for oil companies here locally now. But for a while, many of them were up in Pennsylvania 
and 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 in the Northwest and do well. That, that you know, I think maybe you were alluded to the part of our ag program that's, that is our college kids. It's the it's the leadership stuff. They just won a couple national championships two weeks ago, and I, I just got word that we won area sweepstakes ten minutes ago. So that that's good as well. But and I think we're we're in very much like the schools in Centerville and and, and in Caldwell. Uh, we get it. The, the concern I have as an educator are the things that we can't control. And one common denominator amongst those that, that shared their story with us today was it seemed as if, for the most part, I th- minus maybe one, it's a struggle at home. And that's hard on a young person because, you know, school's tough as it is. And when you're struggling at the house, be it for, uh, be it because of the abusive situation or even those situations where you're forced to work to provide. Uh, for your family, uh, for your for your brothers and sisters, that makes it hard. And and I don't know that schools are set up originally to deal with that. Uh, and that's a great concern because that's something that we will have difficulty influencing. Uh, Caldwell, I'd like to I'd like to ask your thoughts on on this uh, this discussion. What are you What are you thinking? agree with Keith in Madisonville. It is quite a challenge. We uh, also are very heavily reliant on our ag and our uh, medical field programs. And, um, you know, House Bill 5 is the right direction. It will create a lot of more avenues for some of our students. Um, parental involvement is a matter that is a struggle for Caldwell, like many schools. So we're looking for that fine balance, but continuing to support what our students need. Chrissy, I I want to I saw your head shaking. I want I want to hear from you. Well, I, I don't want to dispute all the House Bill Five comments, but I think House Bill Five is going to create more dropouts. It has made it much more complicated. Um, even though the the intent of the legislature was to make it where kids had more options with these five endorsements, if you're looking at what they're rolling out now, all five endorsements are requiring algebra two. Um, the foundation program, where the old minimum program doesn't make you have two years of foreign language, the foundation program requires two years of a foreign language. It has this caveat that uh, that misleads us to think that if they, if states in there, if they're not successful in the first year of a foreign language, then they're going to go to this course that hasn't been created yet, which is a exploratory language course where they get to explore languages, but they've already failed a, a foreign language. So they're already now behind, and now they either have to go back and get that foreign language and then go into this exploration course. So my concern is that House Bill 5, while the intent was to loosen it up and make it broader and to put more of an emphasis on some of the career and tech courses, that, that it has made it very much more complicated, and I'm, I'm very concerned about House Bill 5. Judge Ryder, Judge Henson, any thoughts? Well, uh, I, uh, I still believe that, uh, that uh, while education, uh, you know, college education is a, is a good deal, I still think there uh, needs to be a lot of emphasis on tech and on skills where people could get out and uh, and follow a skill right out of high school after a short interim. And uh, I, I do believe that uh, there's room for both out here. Uh, as you, every time every time somebody runs for office, they run on education. Okay, what kind of education? Are we going to, are we, and every one of us talking about a college education. Everybody is not, don't need a college education. And, uh, the quicker we back up our minds that we don't need, everybody doesn't have to have a college education, the better off we're going to be. Uh, the, uh, all these uh, programs that they make, they try to make it easier to get, for people to get in college. They get in college. Some of them get, uh, go ahead and finish college. Some of them get involved in drugs, some in alcohol, and that's another thing in our, you know, our young people now, uh, now versus when I was growing up, we did not have all of the drug and alcohol and, uh, uh, and peer pressure put on us to be a member of, the, of that of that group because it wasn't available, and nobody had the money to support it. And uh, but uh, I, I still think that uh, that we got to have a balanced program in education, 
And uh, I still think that we need to we need to work on issues that will keep the parent involved in the, in the uh, during the life of the school term of the kid. Because if they don't, they're surely going to drop out. We have a young lady here just recently graduated from the high school here. What last year, year before, two years ago, or something. I graduated in '07. Yeah. From what's, your, what's your thoughts on it? You got it. you. You were you were one <laughs> of the <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Texas uh, national champion. A question, right? Uh, this is this is Randy Stanley. Stanley. This is very difficult for me because I did. I was very involved in school. Um, I did go to A&M, and I got my master's. I was very driven for that. Um, Just because you were prepared well with us. Yes, Massville School is great. <laughs> um, and I also had support at home. So I can vouch for that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean... I was just self-driven and had motivation to do it, I guess. She had the perfect, she was in the perfect scenario from a family standpoint to do well. And she's extremely intelligent and driven. I, I want to, uh, oh, Commissioner Colley? Yeah. I can appreciate everything that's been said and shared, but uh, reflecting on while we're here, there are students that are disengaging. I mean, they are simply zoning out, and that's just my term. Um, we have got, when I say we, I'm talking the community, this nation, we've got to address the issue of, of uh, the failures of our students, and I'm not saying dwell on failures because we all need successes, but we've got students that have simply dropped out of high school and junior high school because they are not able to pass certain tests. You know, they, their future is sealed because they know they're not going to graduate from high school. They can't pass the test. So when I talk to young people in my community, and I'm asking the question, you know, why don't you go to school? It's sad, but a lot of them have just said, it's not for me. There's nothing there for me. I think we have um, an issue that we need to address and that's re-engaging our students and those that are not engaged attempting to engage them because when a person has no hope they have no life and nobody yeah. hope yeah and that's what i see in young people that i've talked to that have dropped out they have lost hope they don't see any way of resolving the situation. So they simply drop out. When I, when I quit school, I didn't quit because I had bad teachers. I had great teachers. Uh, my coaches told me that was the biggest mistake for me to quit because I love playing football. I love to wrestle. I just made a bad mistake. <clears throat> I didn't... Uh, I didn't know how to reach out when I was going to school to talk to a teacher or talk to a counselor. I mean, they were there, but I didn't know that it was okay for me to do that. You know, I, I, I didn't want to show that weakness to my teachers, to my friends, that I had problems at home. So I just quit. I just <clears throat> gave up on myself and <clears throat> just gave up on everything. I just quit and withdrew and hope giving kids hope and telling them that it is possible. Yeah, you're going to have to work hard at it, but you can do it. You might fail a couple of times. You might fail the test, but if you keep at it, you can do anything. And I just think kids get to the point where they just, they don't think they can achieve anything. They have no confidence and they have no hope. So they just quit. And I, I, I want to I, I orient the, the, the discussion onto that topic. We have 
two parts of this issue. We have a quality of it, uh, providing a quality education, preventing high school dropouts, like the great work being done by Chrissy Hester and uh, Principal uh, Morales. But then we have folks like Miss Ethel and uh, um, Barbara and Isidro who's, who, who re-engaged, who, who got that hope and uh, went back to school. At 32 years of age, you went back to school to, to get your GED. I want to I want to ask uh, ask what what it takes to get those students to go back to school, and uh, what's being done by our programs, uh, Tom, your program, our, our programs at BB Cog and Sally. What's being done to reengage students to get students uh, reeducated and uh, uh, and uh, address this need in our community. Uh, thank you, Judson. I think that's a, a good topic for us to talk about. And and one of the things I want to say, the schools, uh, Judge Henson, you're going to love this because um, we do have too much government. Uh, Austin dictates to the school district so many times um, a very narrow path. Um, and many of the schools in our region I'm aware of have started experimenting with different classes and different ways of teaching. And I think that needs to be encouraged. I think we will engage and give this hope to students when we teach the way they can learn. Everybody doesn't learn the same way. I was not a good book student. And if I say the word clown to you, every one of you will immediately, in your mind, picture the clown. I mean, that's just the way we're wired. We can teach many different ways if allowed to, and if the teachers are allowed to come up with those ways, um, to get the same information. No one is born stupid, but we have been able to make them feel that way through this process, and that's what's wrong. We still only do this for nine months out of the year. Why? Why? If you want to talk about the hard things, Judson, and you said you did, these are some of the questions. Why do we do the things that we did 60, 70, 80 years ago when I've got more computing power on my belt than many of the spaceships had 20 years ago. We gotta just change. We gotta, we got to start teaching the way we learn. And we learn visually. Well, Justin, I do want to share about my program, but I also want to share about some of the, about my children and their struggles in high school. I have a daughter that had both her children. In fact, she graduated MC Harris, eight months pregnant with her second child. Um, my son also graduated from MC Harris. Um, he had three credits, supposed to be going into his senior year in high school. He didn't like school. He didn't like the way they did it. He was bored to tears. I don't know what it was, but I was up at the school all the time. Lots of parent involvement. It didn't matter. We got him at MC Harris. He took him exactly six months to get his high school diploma because he did it on the computer. And just as you were saying, we used technology that we had to allow him to learn. Let me just tell you that my boy now is an intelligence analyst in the United States Army. So he, he was able to learn, but they put him as he wasn't, and certainly he had to have some type of a problem to not be able to graduate high school. So that, that aside, I just do want to say that the work you're doing is wonderful and then there are things we're doing for our students. I do also think that if, if as a parent, I wouldn't have pushed as hard as I did, that um, he, my children very well could have fallen through the cracks because there is a process to get them moved over. With all that aside, I do want to tell you that there are things in the community. Um, we have, as I talked about earlier, we have the trade grant that we're working on getting brought from Brenham down to Bryan College Station. We're also um, having an intensive college readiness program. And the biggest thing about this program is I went back to college at 50. It is scary. You don't look like everyone else. You don't sound like everyone else. And it may not be 50 for you. It may be how you choose to dress. It may be ethnicity. It may be your community. I had a young lady, at one of our students, 24 years old. She told me, Miss Sally, nobody ever told me I could go to college. It was not pushed. She was dissuaded from going to college from her community and from her family. So those type of things are sad. But really, we have to work on 
teaching our students to be self-advocates. And the students in our program, the biggest part of our program is not the reading, writing, and math that we teach them. The biggest part of our program is teaching them to be self-advocates. But also letting them know, because if your parents didn't go to college, you don't know who to go talk to. You don't know where the tutoring is at at school. You don't know where to get the help at. You don't know many of the things that these other students have so that you go in and you already feel different. And then you go in there and you don't feel like you can succeed because you don't know how. We have a great partnership now with Blinn College where our students are going in there and when they identify themselves as being one of our students that many of the faculty and staff now are helping them and letting them know. But then they know when they walk in that college, they know where to park. That's so important. How scary is it to not know where to park or to not sit in a college classroom or all these things? And, and I would love for some of the students to come up and say how they feel differently now being able to go to college than when they tried before. And it wasn't a matter of smarts or not wanting to do it or not wanting to get a trade. It was a matter of I don't know how to do it and I'm scared to death. I just wanted to say that I worked for 13 years for the same company when I lost my job, I didn't think I would have problems getting another job. But now, most of the companies will not hire you unless you have a high school graduate or a GED. You can't even get your foot in the door. No matter how intelligent you are, it doesn't matter. You cannot get in. And that needs to be told to the people out there that are facing what I'm facing. You know, I can lose everything. I've got to get my GED, I've got to get a job, and go to work. Everybody needs to know this, the people that do have a good job, because they may not have it tomorrow. It may be gone. What are they going to do? They're going to face like me. They're going to have to get their GED and find a job. Same thing with the students. Let them know. Let them know what they're facing. Poverty, working two jobs to pay their bills just to survive. Get it out there. Let them know what's going on. That way it will help further this, and people will know what's going on. And uh, Judge Ryder, I want to get your thoughts on that. He's talking, he's referring to the, the skills gap that we have. And you, uh, any feedback from your end? Well, I've been sitting here listening to, you know, Judge Henson and, and the rest of them talk. And, and uh, uh, the, the biggest thing that I see now is, and I, and I deal with a lot of juveniles through juvenile court. And the biggest thing I see is that they have no parenting, basically, and there is a gap there between uh, the parents helping them and not helping them and, and the teachers helping them and not helping them. But, um, you know, lots of times in my juvenile class, I'll even, I'll even uh, uh, order the parents to uh, parenting classes to learn what they're supposed to do to be a parent. And it's hard because they, they didn't have parents when they were growing up. And so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a vicious cycle there that we're in. Um, I think the kids nowadays want to learn. I think they really do want to learn. I think that they're really wanting better for the, for what they see their parents have. But they don't, as has been said, they do not understand where to go, how to get the information. And I think we need to be more cognizant of the fact of, of that and try to try to guide them a little bit better than what we do. Um, even, in, even in my court, you know, when and they ask questions about things like that, we... We do try to help them uh, get to the right direction. Uh, they may be in trouble. A lot of it is they're in trouble because of their parents not being parents. And uh, the same thing about uh, going to school or going to college or trade school or whatever. They've never been encouraged that, that, uh, to go to college. They've never been encouraged to, uh, that they can do better, that they can better themselves, better than their parents. Um, and I think that we need to uh, instill that in them, that, that they – they have the opportunity, and uh, and if we can give them that uh, um, needed nudge that they need, then we ought to do that. We have uh, we have nine minutes left uh, in our dialogue. I want to get some closing thoughts. I'll start with uh, Kayla, and then we'll move to Isidro, and and then uh, follow wrap up from there. I wanted to talk a little bit about the program I'm in, the Intense College Readiness Program. I am extremely grateful for this program because, like everyone has mentioned, most people don't know what they're doing when they go back, even young people. I, you know, when I went in, I had to be instructed on how to apply, how to register, 
how what you know college hours were what course hours were semester hours you know what is all that to the person going in having absolutely no idea and through the ICR program they've taken me shown me the campus like I said like she said figuring out where parking is first day I showed up I had no idea I was like oh great you know but like the program has been extremely helpful to me on so many different levels as far as getting you in a college setting getting you ready for what you're going to do getting you ready for who you're going to be around and the assortment of people you're going to be around you know and I feel like you know while everybody is like not good parents not good teachers you know I do feel like the support that I got from Miss Sally from Miss Becky from everybody telling me how good I was doing and that I was going in the right direction pushed me in the right direction and that doesn't just have to be with the parents that can be with the entire school board that can be with whoever you're around but when you have the people at the programs you're at pushing you to do what you're doing and focusing on what you are good at you know that really helps you move forward like Einstein said you know if you judge a fish its whole life on its ability to climb a tree it'll believe all its life that it's stupid i'm not stupid and i know that no one here is stupid and you're all moving forward so if you can have the people around you helping push you forward and give you the steps to move forward it's you know really a lot of people can benefit from it I'd like to respond to some of the questions and some of the comments made by some of the people. Uh, I think your question was, what inspired me to get back into education? Well, I feel like I was railroaded. Can't get a job without a GED. You're railroaded. You can't even fill out an uh, uh, application for work. Once you get to that point on a computer, it's over throw you out. I put over 400 applications in Las Vegas to go to work. Couldn't get past that. So, to answer your question, I was railroaded if I wanted to pursue anything better. I forget your your name. I'm sorry. Tom. Tom. You made a comment earlier, and I think you called adolescents stupid. If I misunderstood you, I'm sorry. I said no one is born stupid. Yeah. No, they, they act stupid, but they're very smart. Very smart. I have an 11-year-old. She's already told me she's making preparations to go to Harvard. And she's going to be the president in 2027. <laughs> <laughs> and to answer the, the lady back there in the pretty white dress and white she said, we, we see things that we haven't seen before. We've seen it all in this country. Pre-World War II, all the men went overseas. Who built our ships and airplanes? Did they go to a technical school? No, we've seen it all. In less than three years... We had welders, we had electricians, we had every skilled opportunist that could be. It takes our educational system how long? And it took them only two or three years to teach them. We had young men flying airplanes. And you know the fact is that probably 50% or more of those people were totally illiterate. That's all. Well, I gotta say I had like 50 other questions for you guys, <laughs> so we're not obviously I'm not gonna be able to ask my questions. So I uh, I do want to close by saying that um, I hope that you walk away and you continue the discussion. Um, we didn't we kind of touched the surface of the issue today, um, but uh, there are. Thousands of families in our community who do not who do not have their GED and who, aren't, who are scared of going back for their GED, and there's students who are are dropping out who uh, whose parents will sign anything to let them drop out of school, 
and uh, teachers who are feeling underpaid and, uh, and uh, demoralized and are, 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 are going to do what they have to in the classroom. And so this is, this is a key, important issue. Uh, when we go home tonight, we're going to listen to the news and we're going to hear about the, uh, the cuts to the food stamp program and uh, the rise in our jails and building jails in our communities. And, and Judge Ryder, you hit on that, the TDC. You know, the fact is that there are underlying symptoms to these issues. And adult education is a severe underlying symptom of these issues. And so I encourage you to continue the discussion. I, I congratulate you on the wonderful work that you each are doing and the incredible future that you have ahead of you. Um, and I want to acknowledge KMUTV. Uh, John, Sharon, you gave us a forum that uh, is just absolutely incredible. So thank you guys so much for this. Thank you. Thank you. I want to acknowledge the Brassus Valley Council of Governments under the leadership and direction of Mr. Tom Wilkinson. Thank you so much for this opportunity. <laughs> College Station ISD, Chrissy and Brian ISD, Principal Morales, thank you guys so much. Thank you both so much for being here today and your team. As well as Caldwell ISD, Hearn ISD, Madisonville ISD, you, you, your folks, you were here just as much as we were right here, and we could hear you just as clearly as you can hear us. So thank you each for, for being here and for contributing and, and uh, continuing the dialogue uh, from here going forward. So thank you all. I want to thank the uh, Region 6 Education Service Center, the uh, Trans-Texas Video Conference Network under the leadership and direction of Tony Hockenberry. I want to thank WNET 13 in New York, Carol Wasey, their Vice President of Education, for your, your support and your uh, 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 grant in our region. And I want to especially thank the Corporation for Public, Public Broadcasting. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Uh, this was a privilege. Thank you so much.